Now I call upon Honorable Member Secretary of ICHR, Prof. Umesh Ashok Kadam for the inauguration speech of the event. Welcome, sir. Vanakkam Chennai. Namaskar Chennai. The dignitaries on the dais. Shri Sandeep Kumar Ji, the Director of the Center of South Indian Studies. Uh, the chief speaker, keynote speaker for today's function, Sri Arivindan Neelakandanji and uh, Dr. Ramadevi Shekhar, Madam, from SSS Jain College for Women uh, on the dais, dignitaries of the dais. I can see many senior personalities sitting over here, uh, faculty members, uh, research scholars, and students which I got to know that there are students from Chennai as well as students from University of Pondicherry who have arrived over here. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to be amongst you today as you all are aware that Indian Council for Historical Research under the auspices of the Government of India has been thriving since the last one year to arrange various kinds of lecture series under the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav as we are celebrating the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav and this is one of the lecture series which has been arranged under the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav and uh, <coughs> it is such a matter of pride that we are celebrating uh, Gazulu Lakshmi Narasu Chetty's contribution as an unsung hero. At the same time when we say that we are celebrating our unsung heroes. Uh, it reminds, it should remind us that what happened to us since last 65 years, that we were not being able to give hmm, the due respect to our unsung heroes since the last 65 years. So something has gone really, really wrong with our understanding of history. In the last 65 years, uh, we all know what kind of history uh, has been promoted through the textbooks, uh, what kind of uh, you know, very precise and uh, a definite kind of an history has been taken up through the university syllabus. And uh, after these uh, 65, 70 years, when we come up with understanding the new education policy, we think that it's time for us to rethink about our own history. So what exactly has gone wrong? Uh, if we can start with understanding our own, if we say, if we go by that kind of periodization which we have been understanding since long through an Eurocentric kind of an binary which has been created uh, in our own histories. So if we go by that colonial perspective, then we say that it is uh, modern period of Indian history. The question comes to one's mind that uh, if modernity is something which is very very special then did India ever witness modernity in its ancient times? Did Indian people ever witnessed modernity in its medieval times? Or is it only the modernity what the Europeans have experienced within their modern times that there is modernity elsewhere across the world and it's that singular point where we can challenge the whole precept, the whole priory which has been created by the Europeans as modernity in the modern world only through their understanding of their two theories which they brought out, one of the theory of the Occident, one the theory of the Orient. So are we going to follow the same footsteps blindly is the first question. Do we really want to you know, go on those footsteps which are very very Eurocentric? I'm just talking about the modern period, the so-called modern period. Maybe I will come to the medieval period. You know, it is such a fascinating thing. One gets a chance to you know come here uh, deep south in the Dakshinapat uh, and have an audience, and I can interact with you. It's been last 22 years I have come back to Chennai. 
22 years back I had come to Chennai. I was on my way to Pondicherry to do my research in Pondicherry with the Ecole d'Extreme. You have a French library over there. The point is, how do we break this ice of the theory which has been created by the Europeans as the theory of Occident and the theory of Orient? Our perception, our understanding, our knowledge system emancipates through their understanding of the Indian situation. Now the challenge is that how do we rewrite, review or in the sense of the French deconstruct the whole theory, the episteme which has been created. Challenging that episteme is very very important. How many of us really know our own languages, our spoken languages across the vernaculars, the local languages and are we aware about how much of historical literature can we perceive from these local literature and have we ever used that kind of a local literature to re-study, re-understand, revisit our own history. Everywhere in the research fraternity, we can see that most of our scholars, they only follow even Indian Sanskrit text translated by Europeans. We follow all European translated versions of Sanskrit, Persian, everything. Have we ever challenged that they are erudite scholars? Have we ever tried to see that whatever they have translated is a correct translation? Is a correct perception? Have they ever been you know, understood the words and the phraseology within the context of the local? There lies, you know, the, the devil lies in the details. So you have to go into the details and then you will come to know that there is a devil over there. And you have to refocus, you have to reinterrogate within those local languages, local literature. You have to make yourself acquainted with your own culture. And that's what is actually known as the idea of Bharat Varsha. That is what is known as the idea of Bharatiyata. If I say all our ancient texts talk about something which is known as Jambu Dvipa, most of our students, most of our research scholars will not be able to tell what is this Jambu Dvipa. India is known as Jambu Dvipa earlier and then it is known as the Bharat Varsha. So what is this Jambu Dvipa? Jambu Dvipa is the full Jambu. In English it is known as water apple. Huh? The land of water apple. Everywhere across you will see within these countries to the Malaya archipelago, everywhere you will find this fruit which is known as water apple. That is the Jambu Fal. And hence it is known as the Jambu Dvipa. So geographical identification was been given by our own Rishis and Munis in the sense that they are so very, so very much environment friendly. And that is why they have given this expression. We don't have to learn about gender and environment eh, and our water resources and how you know eco-friendly we have to be because we have always been that. So we have to you know, reconstruct and rethink upon our own histories. Challenge these colonial percepts and challenging these colonial percepts will come only through revisiting our own historical literature through the local languages and that's the reason ICHR since my joining, we have take up and taken up a uh, you know, pilot project which is known as Digital Library, Creation of a Digital Library of Vernacular Sources for Indian History and Culture. We have identified more than 75-80 institutes across India, which are private institutions and which are repositories of such kind of Pandulipis. And all these Pandulipis, which are having information, historical information right from the ancient world to the medieval world to the modern world are going to be digitalized and they will be coming up on the ICHR portal. Apart from that we are also going to bring out a series of lectures on the Swayam and Samarth Bharat portal wherein experts of 
those pandulipis will express how to understand these documents historically because there are so many people across and so many students saying that oh, you say that you want new history you want the indian side of history but there are no documentation and hence this prayas is been done by us wherein you will be able to know that across india right from the tip of kashmir to kanyakumari and from the reign of kutch to run of kutch to you know the interiors of the ahom kingdoms you will be able to understand that there are so many different kinds of documentations various languages various sources and those sources telling us the day to day records there will be so many unsung heroes we are talking about unsung heroes within an ambit of the indian freedom movement today we talk within an ambit of an indian freedom movement where did these people get their influence from where how were they influenced how did they drew their in inspiration how were they motivated why is it that we are not getting motivated why, where what is the reason that we have stopped thinking we need to rethink we need to you know bring in fresh idea into our social sciences see it has been said very rightly if india is dead it means that the world has been dead already so india is the core of everything india becomes the core of everything everything knowledge various kinds of knowledge you know <coughs> forms have been taken away from india to the world and india has been the mother of democracy across but we are not been able to understand that kind of an influence and confluence of the indian people across the world why it is because the people who came over here within the medieval era and within the modern era they were the people who actually destroyed our libraries our repositories and there were many people as you can know that there were many see the vithala idol in pandrapur is not an vithala who has been worshiped earlier in maharashtra the vithala was been worshiped in kannada kannada region and when there was an islamic uh, onslaught of these iconoclasts the panda the vithala image idol was been taken to maharashtra very silently for 50 75 years the idol disappeared why because they wanted to keep that whole idol intact so it's not the story of idol it's not the story of temple you have to understand what temples are temples are not only places of worship temples are like banks temples are like you know social organizations associations earlier you never had these things so temple was the main center center activity of each and everything where people could come together for all possible reasons which were for the empowerment of the society community at a large so you have to revisit the temple you have to re understand what is the significance of temple it cannot be only like what is known as the identity of church in a sociological term the indian concept of it is completely different you have to re understand and hence i say again and again the context needs to be understood the confluence of each and everything the influence of each and everything far across it's not the indian diaspora in the modern times that is going across it is not the ideas of these people who are which are traveling across why are reviving these ideas of gazulu are important today that gazulu huh <coughs> Uh, Lakshmi Narasu Chetty ji, he did whatever was possible for his time zone. Are we doing whatever is possible for us? Are we following those footsteps? Is the next question. Today also there are certain social problems, but are we trying to, you know, solve those problems through our own research? We have been given. an area where we will be able to do research and we will be able to interact with our own society and we will be able to interact with our own government and tell each and every one how things need to be brought into a proper sequence
and that is the role of the social scientists and history plays a very important role over here it is not that kind of an history which has been told every uh, now and then by dividing us into linguistic states and then by telling us our history that our all history is nothing but about successor states and our history is nothing but about regional kingdoms why we were regional kingdoms why are you telling us a history which grows across talking only about a geopolitical kind of an ideology an epistemy a theory which has been built for indian history only on the precept of understanding indian history in the geopolitical sequence no we should refute that what is needed today is to understand the indian history in a geocultural perception when you understand it in a geocultural perception you will not have these linguistic barriers you will not feel that you are completely different from each other and then you will be able to know how culturally india went across how you can find india in china and mongolia and how you can find india in thailand and in burma and in nepal and in uh, indonesia and far across in many of the islands and in europe you have not been able to find it why because you are not trying to understand the correct sources the authentic sources there are so many sources across which want to have a dialogue with you and hence it is very important now leave aside the modern period if you come into the medieval period again there is a huge crisis about the medieval period in the medieval medieval period you only talk about india from the 13th to the 18th century how many chapters are been devoted on south indian history exclusively apart from south indian universities which talk about history syllabus how many devoted chapters are there how many compulsory core courses are there across north india northeast and in east of india and why should not they be why is it that the people in kashmir and the people in meghalaya and the people over there in gujarat will not know anything about south india's contribution in the mainstream medieval indian history why it becomes something as a regional history and ugc also says that okay you just give 30% of regional history and all of south indian history becomes regional when south indian history is far more important to be the national history of india this kind of history is needed 17th 18th century when we talk about indian history you talk about debates in indian history where you say there is something as consolidation expansion and consolidation of the british power and the downfall of the moguls nothing is there in 17th 18th century 17th 18th century is the century of the marathas the marathas taking control from right from atak to katak everything is under the domain of the marathas so marathas become the national history for the 17th 18th century likewise the 8th century to the 14th century is been never talked about in indian history what i'm trying to say is that even dynasties even the kings the queens the great queens eh, they were not only political identities they are not autocratic rulers like rulers like louis or even rulers ex- extended beyond in portugal or in greece we had you know benevolent monarchs over here who were thinking continuously every day they were devoting their time for the development of the culture they were patron giving patronage for each and everything which went into the society and they saw to it that the society is been empowered every day when are we going to write that history when are we going to give more emphasis on what the kadambas were doing or the dynasties of the kadambas only a section of the cholas is been given more importance but across cholas you have so many contemporary dynasties which need to be talked about why are the nayakas not been represented as the national history of india this is these are certain questions which should pinch us every day these are certain things which should make uh, you know you should tell us that you should not sleep you should be awake and you should rewrite you should rewrite the pride of india you should rewrite the pride of bharata 
and then only you will be able to understand what india has been contributing at large to the world so i really thank the organizers of this seminar shri sandeep kumar ji his team and uh, the august audience over here for giving me an opportunity to be amongst you and patiently hearing me out over here thank you once again namaskar thank you so much for your engaging and entertaining speech sir now i like i would like to invite contributing editor swarajya shri arvind neelakandan for his special address welcome sir gasalu lakshmi narasimha how i came to this name essentially was through a novel tamil novel the tamil novel ku peru vellayane எழுதிய எழுத்தாளருடைய பெயரை நான் சொல்ல விரும்புகிறேன் அந்த நாவல் ஆயிரத்தி எண்ணூற்றி எழுபத்தி ஏழில் உள்ள ஒரு பெரிய பஞ்சம் தாது வருஷ பஞ்சம் என்று சொல்லுவார்கள் ஒன் ஆஃப் த கிரேட்டஸ்ட் ஃபேமின்ஸ் இன் த ஹிஸ்டரி ஆஃப் வேர்ல்ட் விச் கில்ட் ஆல்மோஸ்ட் டென் மில்லியன் சவுத் இண்டியன்ஸ் most probably each of us sitting here would have had a victim from that famine in our family line we would have lost one of our great grandfathers or grand great grandmothers someone in a very tragic way to that famine but that famine had been erased from the textbooks from the memory of the people itself except it is now stored in the folk traditions based on this particular famine the novel was written the chief architect of this famine was sir richard temple but the novel which very in a very graphic way described the misery of the people the tragedies that happened here did not talk a single word about to sir richard temple never mentioned sir richard temple instead it showed the so called upper caste people as the chief villains of the famine and scheduled community as the great sufferers of the famine which was true the former was whether it was true or not i was not knowing so i went and searched for the details about this famine in the, the pancham ruvavadarkana kaaranam endu இவ்வளவு பெரிய ஒரு பஞ்சம் டென் மில்லியன் பீப்புள் சாதாரணமான ஒரு நம்பர் அல்ல இவ்வளவு ஒரு பெரிய பஞ்சம் உருவாக வேண்டும் என்று சொன்னால் அது ஒரு ஒரு வருடத்தில் இரண்டு வருடங்களில் நடந்துவிடக்கூடிய ஒரு விஷயம் கிடையாது மெல்ல 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 அதை நோக்கி இந்த பிரதேசம் சென்றிருக்க வேண்டும் என்ன நடந்தது அபவுட் ஜம்பு தீபா இட் இஸ் அ வெரி இன்ட்ரெஸ்டிங் திங் in tamil literature also it is called novel and thief number 1 number 2 when the marudu brothers fought for freedom they pasted a declaration in the walls of sri rangam temple and it was called jambu deepa pragadana that was the first declaration the war for independence describing that this is a war not for a particular principality but this is the war for entire india and that was done by two tamils marudu brothers and today we have people who question whether we are indians or not marudu brothers had answered that particular question coming back so after the british took over by 18th century the british had consolidated their strangle hold in the south india the rule was made by british east india company but actually british east india company was a proxy face the real rule was done by the british government itself so whenever there was a problem would be put on british east india company for which the directors of british east india company would be handsomely rewarded and the british government was extracting a large amount of money this was the difference between most of the other 
uh, external rulers who ruled India and the Britishers. The Britishers were sucking capital out of this land like anything. And it was fueling the industrial revolutions and other cultural revolutions that was happening in Europe, based in uh, Britain. So this was happening. And for that they have to do excessive taxation. When this excessive taxation was happening, the agriculture system was slowly collapsing. It took a lot of intelligence for people to understand that the agricultural system was collapsing. People knew that something was going wrong slowly, but they did not know exactly what was happening. There were very few people who understood what was happening is going to lead us to disasters. And one of that person was Gaslu Lakshmi Narasuchetti. Who was he? So, Gasalu Lashminar Chetty was born in a uh, community called Gomati community, Gomati Chetty community. They tell that it comes from uh, Gomata or the Gomati river which was a tributary of uh, this. But he was born in the year 1806, we do not know which date he was born, he was not in the habit of celebrating his birthday. He did not have a formal education in the sense he went to school or anything, he didn't go to school. He had his education mainly from our traditional structure, the Tinnai Palli Kudams and all that. And he learned his uh, Kula Dharma which was essentially trading. Then, at that time, the Britain and the British colonies that were in America, they were having a problem. America was waging its uh, war of independence. Because of that, there were problems in international cotton trade. Lakshmi Narasu was able to understand this dynamics. He went there and using his traditional trading knowledge, he used this crisis and he earned a lot of wealth. He came back. He could have lived a happy life, a satisfied life, but he did not. October 2, 1844, 13 years before the first war of Indian independence, he started a magazine called Crescent. He was looking at the way things were getting changed in the society. He didn't like the direction in which it was going. Whether it was the temple lands, whether it was the English education that is being created, given, whether it was the institutions of education that are getting set up. He went through and studied each and every aspect of these institutions. He understood that a big sabotage was happening in this nation. He wanted to fight it. And he understood that the warfare has changed. The ground of warfare has changed. The methods of warfare has changed. So he started a magazine called Crescent. It was a trilingual magazine. It came in three languages. I am talking about 1844. He started a magazine called Crescent. And it came in three languages. English, Tamil, Telugu. Three times a month. The editor of the magazine was a Britisher. He employed a Britisher who was sympathetic to Indian cause and who loved Indian culture. He identified among the Europeans one person like that and he made him the editor. He was an ex-naval officer of British East India Company. Name was Halai. So he joined as the editor. Then he started searching for reporters. He created a network of reporters. Some of these reporters were inside St. George. There was a governor, his name was George Hay. We used to call him Tweeddale, Tweeddale, because he was the eighth Marquis of Tweeddale. So he was, this George Hay was the governor of uh, Madras. He wanted to, he hated Indians. 
he thought that the entire Indian civilization, the Indian society, everything was wrong and we are here to civilize these people, whatever we do is right, whatever these people are doing is useless. So one of the things he was planning and he was planning it inside St. George within his confidential people. But they were keeping minutes. They told that we will introduce Bible as a compulsory course in Madras University. At that time it was a college. And then he said that whoever wants to get the company posting, East India company posting, whoever the, the so called natives, Indians, they have to undergo this particular education. So through this we will be able to get rid of their civilization, their culture, their religion. We would have loyal citizens, loyal subjects. So he was planning this. The year was 1847. So they had planned, they had the minutes, they had to pass the legislation. Before all this happened, these minutes were published in Crescent. The governor was shocked. What was happening? A confidential meeting happening inside St. George. They didn't have cell phone, they didn't have email, they didn't have even telephones. This confidential meetings, minutes have been published in Crescent. Who were the informers? They sacked some 10 officials, both British and Indians. Because one of the important strengths of our Gasalu Lakshmi Narasim was, Narasu was to identify people who are sympathetic to his cause inside any institution and he would use them. That is that way he had used the people and this was the result. And he also exposed another one scheme that the government was doing. I am talking about 1840s, always remember that, the 1840s. British East India Company had a plan to take excess or so called surplus revenue from the temple lands and use it for East India Company. So now with the surplus you can name anything as surplus. British East India Company ki pain padutu adar kaha collector and the galatla governor collectors illan chendu or plan put one. Again, Crescent exposes that. And they had to leave that plan. Think about the kind of daredevil work he was doing. And he was not doing only this. The circulation of Crescent at that time was 10,409. Okay, so he was not only reaching, the problem was this people who could read Tamil or English, they would get this. It, the circulation would have been limited to the city centers. The problem for the government with the Lakshmi Narasu was that he was not just a person who was writing. He organized in what is today Pachepa place, Pachepa college, that area, he organized a mammoth rally in which he talked about all the problems that the people were facing. And the police intelligence, remember again before 1857, we were having a complete British government running here. So this British government that was running here, okay, yeah. I, I think the problem is not the mic, I think the problem should be here. Right. Okay, is it audible for people everywhere? Okay. Okay. okay, okay, it is clear now, I think it is clear now, it is clear. Now, another important thing that he did, which is very very crucial, this is where I, I actually um, came to know about uh, Lakshmi also in this context. He understood that the way the peasants, the farmers in this land were getting harassed by the East India Company officials. And of course, the, at that time, the British East India Company had a police 
and the intelligence bureau and the intelligence bureau was sending a report telling that this man was able to galvanize the so called lower sections of the society so this guy is dangerous his speeches border the sedition so you got to be careful about this man meanwhile lakshmi narzu was not sitting idle he studied the way in which the british east india company people were harassing our farmers and just collecting the revenues fixed it not caring about what kind of uh, situations prevailed what agroclimatic situations prevailed because of that the farmers were suffering the farmers were getting tortured so what did he do he not only organized meetings he contacted members of the british parliament wrote to them and the and he made a petition also and this was in 1852 and he wrote in that petition that the the lands are the the farmers are getting harassed they are getting tortured and the way in which taxation is made is wrong you have to it is far advanced to even today by today standard this particular petition was advanced he said you have to decentralize the system you should not uh, take this money and use for government expenditure reduce the government expenditure think about a person writing this that time reduce the government expenditure give more authorities to the local people so they can use whatever they are gathering for their welfare this way the welfare and happiness of the people will be increased the person was writing this in 1852 to 53 it was veritably a lesson in good governance he was giving to the british you got to think the always the narrative is that the british came and civilized us the fact is that we were able to use the very instruments of british political system to civilize them that way narasim again and again he was telling those people and because of that the way he was writing the way he was able to convince people members of the british parliament started listening to his voice and they said okay there was a denby danby seymour so he said i would come personally and i would make a visit of the places so when he came to india lakshmi narasu took him to kumbakonam koyambutur tanjavur all the places where there was rich cultivation he took them he took him to all these places and made him see what was happening because of that the torture commission was initiated by the british government so they came here they studied the entire thing on 15th april 1856 this report of this torture commission was presented in the british house of nobles this was a great victory for indians and then came 1857 and people were not very happy with uh, lakshmi narasu in a way they were trying to destroy him completely they would have done that they couldn't do that because of 1857 lakshmi narasu also concentrated on education the case of education he was the first person to suggest that there should be schools for women and the girl children should be educated and he was supported by two people these two people again we have to go and search about these two people very important people one person's name was venkata lakshmanayya and another person's name was srinivas pillai these two people they had started something called madras hindu literary association that was in 1833 even before lakshmi narasu started his works and they started a school the school there was four language formula english tamil telugu sanskrit the students were learning four languages think about the capacity the brain capacity such students would have had 
four languages. When you learn four languages, you are learning to see the world in four different ways. In this, I have to also say another one thing. Um, he talked about the translations of ancient texts. Forget the ancient texts. You take the novels that are written today. The modern novels that are written today. The translations are made by Sahitya Academy. How do they do the translations? For example, they translate a Telugu novel to English. Then, if that novel is to be translated into another Indian language, from that English translation, we will be doing the other language translation. So, from Bengali to English and from English to Tamil. That is the way we translate. We essentially translate a dry translation. The spirit would be lost. The names would be lost. I will give you an example, a very tragic example. In our place, whenever there is a village festival, we used to call it Kodai. Kodai means festival in South Tamil Nadu districts. So a person has written a novel based on this and he had used the word Kodai. And a person translated it for Sagiti Academy. The person translated it. I won't tell the names and all. Kodai was translated into Amprala. So that is the kind of translations that we have because we lose, this is in the form. We lose also the spirit of translation. In this context, you have to understand. And I have a friend, a person called Sethupati Arunachal. He wanted to translate Vibhuti Bhushan Bhattopadhyaya's novel on Bengal famine. So for that purpose, he didn't want to do a translation of translation. So he learned Bengali. He learned Bengali and he translated that novel. So that is how we have to do the translations actually. You have to know the language to do the translation. Know the novel in the original, text in the original. And remember, all Indian languages are related. All Indian languages are related. Unfortunately, we are told that certain Indian languages are different. For example, you have the word Dharma. The word Dharma is there in Hindi. And what is the equivalent of Dharma in English? No, nothing. What is the equivalent of Dharma in Tamil? Aram. So Aram is there, Dharma is there. There are equivalents in these two languages, but these two languages are supposed to be against each other, but English is supposed to be friendly with them. This is the kind of tra cultural tragedy into which we are being trapped today. In this situation, you have to remember Lakshmi Naruso's friend, these two people, they started a school in which four languages were taught to the children. And what did the British do? They starved this school into death. Before the famines started, they destroyed the school. The school was denied any kind of help by the British East India Company. The same British East India Company that was taking the revenue from our people, it did not support a school that was run by our people for our children. And today we are told the British brought education. Even in their own system, they didn't allow Indians to run a school. In this, you have to remember, this Venkata Lakshmanaya was a member of Royal Asiatic Society even then. And he writes a petition. I am talking about 1833 now. And he writes a petition telling this particular school is taking scientific knowledge to the children in their mother tongue. Think about the year. Think about the dates. So you should allow us to live. The British denied them this particular aspect. In fact, he was able to again convince members of the Royal Asiatic Society to support him. So this is the kind of strength which with this vision with which these people had worked. And then we come to this particular aspect. So this torture commission it, in a way, saved Indians in a very big way. Otherwise, we would have had another one famine in between 1857 and 1877. Then, the 1857 happened. That, in a way, saved Lakshmi Narasur. The government understood that if they are going to take action against Lakshmi Narasur in this particular juncture, it would create problem in a very big way, in a huge way, in here. So, they decided not to do that. And 
they made a kind of pact with him. They gave him a title, everything, but he didn't stop. He was going on fighting. Till the end, he was fighting. He was petitioning the government. He was gathering the people. He was talking to them. And he was monitoring both the economic as well as the cultural aspects of the nation. In Madras University, they brought in as head of Sanskrit department a scholar called Peter Percival. Peter Percival was known for his hatred for Indian culture and Indian Dharma. And when he was brought, Lakshmi Narasu had launched a movement called Madras Mahajana Sabha. This Madras Mahajana Sabha, they gathered and they said that this man should not be brought. He had made translations of Tamil classics and always he had twisted the text. These people have noticed that. They made a petition telling what are all the texts this man had during their his translation twisted, given wrong meanings, particularly in the works of Avaya. So they created this and they presented to the board. That was in 1859. So he was doing this again and again and all this. Meanwhile, his downfall came. How his downfall came? Not by the British this time. The downfall came because of our own people. He had got great wealth and he has spent all his wealth in these activities. The circulation of crescent started falling and falling and falling. At last it came to 150 or something. Crescent had to be stopped. Then he died in utter poverty. Complete poverty. A person who could use international dynamics between British and the Americans to amass wealth and then spend that wealth to fight against the British. How did he fight against the British? He fought against the British using their own institutions, using their own methodology. He was able to create a network of Indian lovers. All the people who love India, they would come into his network and he would use them to further the cause of India. That such a person, he could have used his networking skills to further his wealth. He could have used his networking skills to live a very comfortable life. He could have settled in United States, he could have settled in England. He would have been considered as a great person. Today, he lived in a Madras. There is one street somewhere named after Gasalu Lakshmi Narasimhu. And now think about the 1877 famine. The 1877 famine happened because there were no persons who were able to see into the dynamics and present the case of India like this. Had there been a Lakshmi Narasu at that time, the famine would not have happened. The famine happened because there were no visionaries. And unfortunately, we have forgotten him, or rather, we have been made to forget him. Because the narrative is set in such a way that we are told we didn't have institutions of justice, we don't have the capacity to understand the British democracy, we don't have the capacity to understand the democratic values. Only after the missionaries came, only after the Britishers came, we were able to understand all this, we have been told. Lakshmi Narasu points out that we had the inner strength to change the narrative using their own institutions and their own methodology because this culture had its instinct values, the instinct strength to fight against colonial oppression. This way, Lakshmi Narasu shows us the path. Today we live in a world in which when I tell network, you all would have remembered your social networks. We have great strength to challenge the narrative. We have great strength to rewrite the narrative. And we have great strength to create a new India. We have in fact more strength in terms of 
quantity we have more strength than Lakshmi Narasa would have ever imagined in his life. But what we are using it for? We are using it to fight very cheap battles of ego between jatis and between religions and gaining brownie points. If I can attack a particular religion in a very vulgar way, then I feel very satisfied in the social media. If I can attack a particular jati in a very vulgar way, I feel very happy. I have given him a fitting reply. That is our ego satisfaction. But what kind of transformation we can do to this nation using the same social network? When you think about that, you think of Lakshmi Nars. He was a great person of networking. That is why his magazine, it used to send shivers to the spine of every British administrator in this nation. Such a person finally died in poverty, but with patriotic abundance. He died in terms of financial poverty, he died, but in terms of patriotic richness, he was a very rich person. But now, we have forgotten him, completely forgotten him. We have a lot of false heroes, but we have forgotten the real fighters. Lakshmi Narasu is one such fighter. May his memory inspire us to fight for India, to live for India. Thank you, Jai Hind. Thank you so much for your informative speech, sir. As we bring close to this session, I call upon Mr. Kumaresan, coordinator of CSIS, to propose the vote of thanks. One day, a national seminar for the Zulu Lakshmi Narasu Chetty. So, wonderful seminar now going on. So, first session now is completed. So, next session is announced, announced in fact. So, we express our sincere graduate to Honorable Member of Secretary ICHR, Sri Umesh Ramesh sir, who inaugurated the event and delivered the wonderful keynote speech. And we express our sincere graduate, Sri Aravindan Nilagandan, who spoke to detail about the Sulu Lakshmana Swati. And we express our sincere graduate to Sandeep Kumar, Director of Center for South Indian Studies and Srimadhi Ramadevi Sagar, SSS Jain College, so who is inaugurated as speeches and we are sincere graduate to all professors and teachers, students and historians and participators. So we would, we would to like to express our sincere graduate to the school management of providing the school premises to host the event. So we express our sincere graduate to the food distributors and decorators, video coverages and volunteers. Thank to all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Although the saying goes, all good things must come to an end, we have the second session at 12.30. I request all the history staffs and historians to join back at 12.30. Following the national anthem, I invite you all to join for tea and snacks. Now I request you all to rise for national anthem. <laughs> Dravid Utkala Munga Vindahi Machala Yamuna Ganga Utchala Daladi Daranga Dava Jahi Dava Shuba Ashisha Mahi Gagi Jai 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 Jai